Well, good morning again. I know it's cold, but you can wake up. Hey, can we? I'm I'm more blind than uh, than Pete, so can we turn the house lights up so I can see everybody? Maybe. Well, if you haven't already looked at, there you are. Hey, good looking guys and gals. If you haven't already looked at our uh, title for our message today, um, hopefully it comes up, it's This Is My Offering. So before you sprint for the exit, we're not actually going to be talking about money. So if you're online, don't, don't turn us off. Uh, we're not going to be looking at your finances today. However, if that's something that you uh, are struggling with, Pete and I did a series last, uh, last fall called Our Best Life Later. So... If you do want a, a sermon or a sermon series on that, you can check that out online. But the offering that we're going to look at today is uh, way more than money. In fact, we're going to be looking at what God wants from you, and what God wants from you is a lot more than just money. And so I want to start with this question. Have you ever asked that, que- uh, asked that question? Lord, what do you want from me? I mean, have you ever asked... Have you ever said in your prayers, God, what do you want from me? What are you expecting from me? Maybe, maybe there was a time life wasn't going well. Um, you were feeling a little lost, feeling disappointed, uh, feeling, feeling down, confused, maybe even depressed. Think back to a time that you were struggling um, for even to, to discover what your purpose was in life. You get frustrated And you cry out to God, you know, God, why am I here? Have you ever asked that? Lord, why am I here? What's my purpose? Maybe you were chasing something that you really wanted, and it just didn't happen. You were uh, wanting to be successful at a certain, certain thing, and you came up short. And you're like, I thought this was why I was here, what I was made for, but apparently not. And so you turn around and you ask God what... Why am I here? What do you want from me? Or maybe like King Solomon, you experienced a lot of life and you experienced some success, but you still came up empty, feeling feelings of, of just meaningless. Or do you remember a time in your life when you were at a crossroad, not sure which way to go, and you're, you're asking God for help and direction? Have you done that? He prayed, prayed to God, hey, Lord, give me some direction. I'm not sure what to do. Can you just tell me which way to go? Have you ever prayed that? Wouldn't it be nice if he did that? If we could just say, Lord, I don't know what the right thing is to do. Can you just, just lay it out there for me? Um, I, I think the older, the older we get, the older you live, and the more crossroads you face. Because you're just, you're faced with many, many possibilities in life. In fact, uh, um, just uh, these past couple years, uh, my dad has been a, a, at a crossroad trying to decide when to retire. When's the best time to retire financially? What's going to be the best thing? You know, some of you ex- have experienced that. And on the flip side of that, before you start your career, you're at a crossroad. Some of you, uh, you teenagers, you know, 20-somethings, you're still trying to figure out, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? Should I go this way or should I go that way? Because you only got one life and you don't want to mess it up. So, have you ever prayed, Lord, tell me, tell me which way to go? What do, you, what do you want from me? I remember contemplating that question about 25 years ago, wondering which direction I should go. Should I stay in the family business or pursue a seminary and go into, into ministry? And I, I remember, Lord, just tell me which way to go and I'll do it. If you want me to stay doing this, I'll do it. I'll do it with all my heart and serve you. Or I... I, I can go into ministry, but would you just tell me, what do you want for me? What do, you, what do you want me to do? I think of all the people who have ever lived, who believed in God, we've all asked that question, Lord, what is it that you want from me? I bring this up today because Pete started our New Year's uh, uh, series last week called Ordinary. And In this series, we're going to be looking at the ordinary Christian life. 
And I think you will find that it's not so ordinary, not if you're truly following Christ, that it actually is quite extraordinary from a worldly perspective. Let me give you an example. This is something that we've, uh, we've turned to many times when it comes to what Jesus says as, as far as his expectations of us. So this is Matthew 16, 24. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So you, you know the scripture, right? Then he says, for whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, especially from a worldly perspective, that's not an ordinary life. In fact, that's quite radical. It's radical because the answer to that question of God, what do you want from me, is you. When you ask that question, God, what do you want from me? His answer is you. And it's not the dramatic, something dramatic he wants from you. He's not asking you to be Moses and lead his people out of Egypt. He simply wants you. He wants you to be saved. In fact, the Bible says it's God's desire that nobody perish, that everybody's saved. And so first and foremost, God wants you, and he wants you to be saved. And in order to do that, you have to give your life to Christ. And Jesus keeps it pretty cut and dry. He says you can't hold anything back. If you want to you lose your life, then keep it. If you want to gain your life, then give it to me, give it away. If you try to save your life by your own power then what's going to happen? A lot of frustration, and you're going, to let, you're going to end up going down a roads, one after another that leads to dead end after dead end after dead end. But if you give your life to Christ, your entire life to Christ, then this ordinary, everyday life becomes more than just ordinary. You'll find that no matter what your ambition is in life, if you give your life to Christ, whether you have big dreams and big goals or small ones, whether you want to accomplish a little or a lot, you discover if you, if you give your life to Christ wholly, you will discover true worth. You will discover that as, as, a, as a human, you're not just human, you're a child of God, and you will find value. You will find your, your true identity is found in him. You'll find your true purpose. See, all these crossroads that we face in life, these difficult decisions that we, we want help with, questions of identity, our struggles with self-worth, our struggles with finding purpose, the dreams we chase, the hopes that we have, we pray, God, please help us, give us direction, tell me what to do, tell me what's expected of me, what you've put me here for, and we pray these prayers, do we not? And how many times do we pray these prayers and it seems like God's not listening? Am, am, I, am I the only one? Like, maybe, maybe he is listening, but he just, we're not getting the answer that we want. Maybe we feel like, well, I've done something wrong. And that this is God's, he just said, well, you should have done this, so now this is what you're stuck with. Listen, I think all our struggles for those unanswered prayers or the answers that we don't like, they come down to this, not understanding what God actually expects of you, not understanding what God actually wants from you. And listen, it's not your accomplishments. That's not what God's looking for. What God's looking for, it's you. It's just you. Not part of you. All of you. Not, not you checking off all of the religious boxes. Oh, I did this, I did this, I did this. No, God's, what he wants from you, it's very simple. It's very ordinary. It's you. Have you given him yourself? Not just part of yourself, but all of you. See, the problem is, is that we go into the, the, the baptism, we give our life to Christ, and then we start this life with Christ. And we've, we've, we've been told, here, I've, I've laid my life at Christ's feet. We start this, this life with him, and we get tempted to take some things back. There, there's some things that we, we, we laid at his feet to begin with, and we're like, oh, we want to we pick that old thing back up. 
And when we do that, it leads to frustration, disappointment, discontent, the list goes on. So I, wanna, I want us to look at a very small, familiar passage today. And it talks about how we offer all of our life to Christ. And we're going to try to pull out just a very practical understanding of what it means to, to just give all of ourselves to God. So this is in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. We'll look at these two verses. So this, is, this, is, this should be familiar as well. And here, here's what Paul says. He's talking about our spiritual act of worship. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. What, is, what does that mean? Living sacrifice. It sounds good, right? But what does it mean? What is he talking about? He goes on to say, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, but that by the testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is, your, this is your living sacrifice. This is your act of worship. Not just now, but on a continual basis. Well, what does that mean? How do, we, how do we live that out? Well, if, you, uh, if you've ever read the, the message version of the Bible, that translation, I want to walk you through what it says. It kind of expands on this meeting. And I'm going to pull out some practical examples of what, what this life of a, a living sacrifice can mean and how that, how that works between us and God. So let's read through this. Okay, so we're, we're back, back at the beginning, verse 1, and this is, just going to, to, this is going to just pull out some meaning here, some application for us. It says this, so here's what I want you to do, Paul says, God helping you take your everyday ordinary life. Okay, that's, that, we're on the same page. Your everyday ordinary life, you're sleeping, eating, going to work, you're walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. All right, that's what God wants for, from us, us. Our everyday life, give it to him. And then he says, embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God You'll be changed from the inside out. And he closes with this. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around us, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings out the best of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. So here's what I want you to show, what I want to show you with, with this. What Paul calls this living sacrifice, the spiritual act of worship. This is taking your everyday ordinary life and understanding that you're in relationship with God. This is a covenant relationship. This is not a contract. When we talk about our covenant with, with God in the New Testament and that, that covenant um, um, agape love, it's not a contract where I'm demanding, hey, you owe me this and I'll do this. A covenant is a, is, is, a, is a give and take, and not, a, not, not a, even a give and take, it's a, it's a give and give. We're not taking from one another, but it's reciprocal. Tim, you know how many times I practiced reciprocal this week to make sure that I said it right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's this back and forth, this healthy back and forth that God's looking for. So think about what we just read. Paul says, embrace what God has done for you or is doing for you. Readily recognize, okay, embrace what God's given you. And then recognize now what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. So he's, look, he's looking for some reciprocation. I didn't practice that one, but I got, I got it. So I want to give you an example. I've got a volunteer that's going to come forward. My youngest son, Joe. Come on down, Joe. Hey, no applause yet. He hasn't done anything. <laughs> All right, give it here. Don't get too far away. So this is my uh, youngest son, Josiah. And who, we got back up a little bit, but give us some room. All right, right there is good. All right, if you miss, you can hit read, not Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So as my youngest son, Joe, um, in whom I'm well pleased, he's playing basketball right now at Eastern, but he's a football player as well. So uh, we were talking football. We're going to be watching some football later on, later on today. And so I want to show you how this, how this relationship, this back and forth with God can work. And we're going to use a very simple, simple scripture. John 3, 16, right? We know, we know how that goes. So for God to love the world, what? That he gave. Oh, that was a close one. Hey, better hands, man, hands. Sorry, hey, move a little farther this way. I do not, I don't want to take down a man. I, I buy coffee from her, so I want it to still be good, okay? So that he gave. Gave what? His only son, so that who shall ever what? Believe. believe. So it's not just believe. It's I'm going to put my trust in God. I'm going to put my faith in God. So put your trust, put your faith, okay? Give it back. And so here, here we've begun the back and forth. And so whoever believes, okay, puts their trust and faith in God, God does what? Gives eternal life. Okay, so that's where the back and forth begins. However, do we just take our ball and go home? No. What, there's, what does God want from us now? There's, there's something that he wants. What's Jesus say? Jesus says, if you love me, you'll do what? Keep my commandments. So, obedience. Son, throw me the ball. All right, very obedient. All right, good job. Okay, I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of 101. We're supposed to follow him. All right, but, but sometimes in our obedience, you know what to do? All right. We make very bad throws. <laughs> All right, we, we didn't even rehearse that. That was good. That was a good disobedience. Stay there. We're not done. So, so, so this back and forth, healthy back and forth, is what God is wanting from us. That's the... That's the reciprocation, the give and give. And the problem is, is that happens a lot, the bad throws. All right, stay there. What happens when we have bad throws? How does God respond? He responds with grace, all right? Okay, I messed up, and he responds by giving us grace, all right? Well, how else does he respond? Okay, Joe, ha have you ever had any bad throws? And you know we're not talking about actual bad throws, right? Okay, so have I given you grace when you've made some bad throws? Yes, just like we rehearsed, remember? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time we get grace. He might get a little something else with that, but I do give him grace, all right? Now, when you made some bad throws, Joe, have I ever given you any guidance? Probably way more than you wanted, right? But that's what God does. We make bad throws and we're like, man, that's, I, it makes you not even want to pray and talk to him because you, it was my bad. But God, but God says, hey, trust me. I know it was a bad throw. So we go to his word, what Psalm 119 says, that his word is what? A lamp to our feet. Gives us direction. Yeah, that was a bad throw, but here's what you need to do to correct that. Here's a different, different way, a better way. But we attempt that. <clears throat> Joe, have you ever made any bad throws and I've responded with goodness? <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, I'm not God. Right? I'm your dad, so you can go sit down now, okay? Woo, that was a close one. But aren't you glad that with our bad throws, God responds not just with grace and guidance, but goodness? Amen. Because some of our bad throws aren't our fault. And the enemy is after us, trying to sack us, trying to make us fumble the ball. But God responds to all of our bad throws, to all of our fumbles with goodness. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and future. 
Doesn't, doesn't say you won't struggle, you won't experience pain and disappointment. It just, it just says he'll always be working for your good. And so we are to embrace these things. We receive these things and we embrace them. But the back and forth doesn't stop. How do we respond to these things? Well, we respond with repentance, right? We made a bad throw, we fumbled a ball, we respond with repentance. And then we respond with trust. We look to God's word. This is how I messed up. How do, how do I do it better the next time? And then we've got to trust that how, he, how God says to do it is going to work. And then that comes obedience. We, we, go, we, we try it again. We try to be obedient. And of course, that obedience, we, don't, we still don't get it perfect every time. So... How does God respond to our repentance, trust, and obedience? How does he respond? Okay? With love. Okay? Here's what, here's what his love looks like. Blessings. Transformation. He changes us. Growth. Joe, you still got the ball? All right. One more, one more throw. All right. Uh, I'm going to catch this with the light in my eyes. Wait, we don't want to hit Pete's TV. <laughs> All right. We can, hit, we can hit Kyle's piano, but not Pete's TV. All right, give it. Come on. That was a good catch, was not it? Light was in my eyes. Listen. Obviously, uh, Joe not my biological son when we got him I mean he barely weighed as much as this football and he, he could barely kick a football let alone or a, a soccer ball let alone throw a football and so you know since we've had him since he's two you know we've we've played catch and there was a time that you know, playing catch was I was just trying, especially with the baseball, not to hit this kid in the head. <laughs> it's like, try to catch it out here. But that back and forth as, as, as we begin that relationship with God, it isn't as good as that throw. Okay? It's, it's, it's you know, you've, you've played it with your little kids. Tossed it here and back. And there's fumbles and mistakes. And God just loves you through it. But, but now, you know, I can send him long. For the most part, he's, he's going to catch it, but he can throw me a good pass. The, the back and forth between Joe, Joe and I has, has, has a, has, is just miles different than what it was because there's been growth there. That's this ordinary, everyday life, if you embrace it, how it will work. God, God will bless you through all the fumbles and bad throws. He will transform you to be more like his son. He will grow you. Okay, it's, it's all about uh, how, how this love flows back and forth between us and God. This healthy back and forth. That's how any good relationship is. I mean, we know the greatest two commandments. What? To love God and to love others. God wants to keep things moving back and forth between us and him and back and forth between us and others. You go on to read the rest of Romans chapter 12, and Paul lays out that well-formed, mature life and what it's, what it's to look like. Because what, is, what does God do next? What happens, what happens to our relationship when we reach this? Okay, we start to think, once this begins to happen and there's a little bit of growth, we start to think about what? Our purpose. Oh, what? Man, you've loved me, I've loved you. What's my purpose then? We start to think about our calling. What might God calling me, be calling me to do? We start to want to um, know what our spiritual gifts are, right? Because we want to serve. This loving back and forth is serving God, serving others. We, we are given spiritual gifts specifically to edify one another, the church. And this is dangerous territory. Because when we think about what is my spiritual gifts, if once we announce we're going to have a class on spiritual gifts, it'll probably be as full as a class that we've ever, have ever had because we want to know. But it's dangerous. 
Because when we get overly concerned about where our calling and what our purpose is and what my spiritual gift is compared to your spiritual gift is, this is where pride wants to come in and, and say, you take the glory. Because you are, na- you are now ha- arrived. You've grown. And pride says nothing, God had nothing to do with it. So that's a dangerous place to be. So we have to be very careful. But can you see how this back and forth is supposed to work? That's, that's the whole, our act of worship, just the everyday, ordinary living, giving ourselves to him. And remember, this back and forth isn't a give and take, it's a give and give. God never, God never puts his thumb on us and makes us obey, makes us repent. He doesn't do that. He doesn't work that way. Love naturally flows back and forth in this relationship with him. That's how it's supposed to work. And when it's working well, Paul says it produces in us a well-formed, mature child of God. But when it's not working well, it's not because God dropped the ball, because we dropped the ball. In fact, it's not that we dropped the ball when it's not working well. It's that we decided, we decided to play catch with somebody else besides God. We decided to play catch with the world. And so transformation still takes place. It's just not a godly transformation. And the world and our culture, it doesn't build you up. What does it do? Paul says it brings you down. So listen, folks. You've got to understand that this everyday ordinary life can be quite extraordinary if you are just lay it every day, everything at his feet. And not just once a week. This, this daily walk with him, do you know it? I want to ask you, do, do you walk with him daily? Or is it just when you have time? Do you have a casual relationship when it's convenient? Or is Jesus part of your everyday, ordinary life? Is this, if this everyday, ordinary life with Jesus sounds strange to you, then, then let's talk. I'll go buy you coffee. I'll go buy you lunch. Let's talk about it. You don't want to talk with me? There are a lot of good, mature Christian men and women here. Go buy them coffee. Go buy them lunch. Say, hey, tell me more about your walk with, with Christ. Not that it's got to, you know, you've got to do exactly what I do or what anybody else does. But you can find your own little rhythm with God. If you don't have it, man, you're going to continue to make bad passes and fumble the ball, get sacked in life. You're going to have an opportunity here in about six weeks to kind of learn more about it. After uh, Pete gets through this next series of Ordinary, uh, him and I are putting together a 40-day campaign called 40 Days with Christ that's going to take us up to Easter. And you're going to have opportunities to kind of uh, tune up that everyday walk with Christ or maybe discover it for the first time. But before we get there, there are some things you can address in our current series with your relationship with Christ. And in particular, you're going to be challenged in the following weeks. You're going to be challenged to let go of your pride. You're going to be challenged to let go of your ambitions. In fact, you might even be challenged to let go of your dreams. Because if your dreams do not include Jesus, then of course you should be letting him go. And listen, I know what it is to let go of your dreams. About three years ago, I, I let go of mine. I, I made the, the decision with my wife that we're going to move back to Kokomo, Indiana to be close to home. But that meant giving up my dream to possibly continue to be in ministry. But I laid it at his feet. And here's the cool thing. He gave me back more than I deserve. That's what he does when you lay it all on him, all your wants, your desires, when you lay your down your whole life, what Paul calls a living sacrifice, and he calls it a living sacrifice, why? Because what does it take to repent? You gotta sacrifice your pride, right? I, I was wrong. God's right, his way is, is, is holy and righteous. I, I have to repent that, you gotta sacrifice your pride. What does it take to trust God? You have to lay down your security blanket. 
You have to sacrifice the things that you trust in and trust in him. You got to put your trust into him. What does it take to obey? Well, certainly it takes discipline, but you have to sacrifice your desires. You have to sacrifice what you want to be obedient to the God that you love. Paul calls this, all this, the living sacrifice, your spiritual act of worship. You know, in the Old Testament, every time an offering was made, almost every time an offering was made, something had to die. What is it that possibly needs to die in you today? What part of the old life you tried to give new life to that needs to be buried once and for all? What part of your life are you not giving over to God? Look what, look what Paul says here again in Colossians 3. Since you have been raised in a new life with Christ, this is what it's supposed to look like. Set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. I mean, we've got earthly responsibilities. You've still got to take care of them, but you've got to set your, your mind on the things of heaven. Then, and then he says, for you died to this life, your real life is hidden in Christ. Where is your life hidden this morning? What are you holding back from God? Listen, as always, we're going to offer an invitation before we close, but we're not going to close yet. We're going to offer an invitation to, before we close to accept Christ, but before that, we're going to come around the communion table. We're going to participate in the Lord's Supper, and we're not going to just meditate. We're going to reflect. We're going to take a little bit extra time to do this this morning. And so everybody here, and if you're, on, if you're online, let's prepare ourselves. Okay, Kyle, wherever Kyle's at, Kyle's going to come out. He's going to play a little music in the background. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read a list of things that, either some, that some of us um, need to lay down that we've been holding back from God. And as I read through this list of things, you might uh, become convicted. At any point while the music is, is playing and I'm reading through this list, you feel convicted, that would be a good time to partake of the, of the bread and the cup. Because communion means communion. And so anytime you're convicted in the next five minutes, and you're like, yes, this part I've been keeping from God. There is no communion with this specific thing and, and God. And I, I want this. I've been holding it back. I want to lay it at his, at his feet. So that's how I want you to approach this time. And even if I don't list that one thing that you're holding back, you know what it is. So Kyle, go ahead and begin. And I'm going to read. And it, whenever you're ready, you can partake as I go through this list. Then I'll give you a little bit of time before I pray. And then we'll close out with an invitation but let's begin let's begin the list of some possible things you might be holding back from God part of you that you're holding back so let's start with finances now I'm not a liar I said that the whole sermon wasn't about money I didn't say I wasn't going to mention it but maybe that's you you're not God's not a part of your finances not part of your money Are you holding back that part of your life? And I'm not just talking about your cash, but all your resources. Are you holding them back? What about your time? Think about the time that you spend. Are you holding time back from, from God? Spending time with Him? Spending time serving Him? You know, your talents? You holding them back? Maybe you got some talents that could bless God's kingdom, God's church but you're holding it back. Are you serving God? Or are you serving yourself? What about yourself? I mean, your physical body. I mean, think about your health. You taking care of yourself? I mean, I'm not just talking about your diet, but your mental health. You taking care of yourself? You getting enough rest? You getting enough sleep? You know, one, a Bible professor told me once, he says, sometimes... The most spiritual thing that we could do is take a good nap. You know why? 
Because when we're tired, we get grumpy. And when we're tired and grumpy, we become easy pickings for the enemy. You taking care of yourself? All right. Are you you're not laying, we're living that truly sacrificial life of laying, laying your, your body before the Lord as well. Treating your body as a temple. What about your marriage? Husbands and wives? Is that, do you have that healthy give and give relationship? Is there healthy back and forth? You're loving one another like the Bible says to? Are you, you have that oneness in all aspects of your life? And this isn't just for, for marriage, but it's a little more sensitive, but I've got to say it, your sex life. Is God, are you honoring God with that? Are you honoring God with your desires? And listen, if you're younger here, and we're not talking bad about sex, sex is good. God created sex. I mean, the intimacy between a husband and a wife, it reflects the oneness that he's given us in marriage. Are you honoring God with that? Relationships, not just the marriage one, but all your relationships. Think about them for a moment. Is there any bitterness there with your relationships? Are you harboring some, 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 some just hatred even? You have some conflict that you're just ignoring. Are you struggling to forgive somebody? What conflict, what heartbreak are you holding on to? Lay it at Jesus' feet today. What about your disappointments? You didn't get this job or he or she didn't do that for me. I had these goals, these dreams, and they seem to be gone. Your life has not turned out how you wanted it to. You can become bitter and even depressed. Give it over to Jesus today. Ask him to help you be satisfied and content right now with your situation, whatever it is. Because when you lay it at your, all at his feet, that's when you can find that mercy and grace and love you've been missing. And right along with that, your pain. Oh, Lord, we have so much pain in our in our community and in our church so many health issues and our congregation isn't any different but there's a lot of people suffering and listen if that's you if you're dealing with some physical pain mental pain listen pain when we're in pain it's easy for Satan to poke holes in our faith So you got to give your pain over to the Lord. You can't hold on to it. Your pain, your disappointment, your struggles. Oh, church. These disappointments and pains and struggles, they can make you want to take your football and go home. Don't do that. Lay it at his feet today. What is it this morning that you need to lay at his feet? Your obedience, you're not trusting him somewhere. You need to repent. What are you holding back? I want you to lay it at his feet. Lay it at his feet. If you haven't already partaken of the bread and the cup, I encourage you to do so now. In just a moment, I'm going to pray. And we'll have an invitation. So, Father, for everybody here who are or people listening on, I just I lift up our church to you because for whatever reason we tend to want to hold on to part of our life and not give it to you. For whatever reason, Lord, we forget how rewarding the back and forth between you and I are supposed to be, how a healthy relationship works Lord I remind us all this morning of your grace your guidance and your goodness and help us to respond to that 
Help us to respond by just not holding back what we've been holding back. To lay all that we have at your feet. We want communion with you in every aspect of our lives. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. So if you're here today and you haven't accepted Christ, man, are you tired of getting sacked? Are you tired of fumbling the ball? Then, then give up the ball. Give it to the Lord. Give, give your life to the Lord. Isn't it about time you've done that? For the rest of you, what happens when we hold on to the ball? What happens when the quarterback holds on to the ball? He gets sacked. You fumble the ball. Are you tired today, church, of not having that healthy back and forth? Then maybe today is the day you decide, hey, I am going to truly lay it all out there for him. My everyday ordinary life is yours, Lord. And listen, the church, we do our best to give you opportunities. Okay, we've got, you know, on Sundays, we've got a good Sunday school class back here, the Gospel of John. I just started a class on the attributes of God. We're talking about how awesome God is and all of, it, all of the different characteristics that make him so awesome. We just started that this morning. Wonderful discussion. What, maybe you need to get back to some of the basics. Even if you've been here for a while, we just started a What We Believe class. Maybe you need to get back to that. That's, on, that's here in uh, this room right here to my left, room 13. You know, these are just some practical ways. Maybe you need to get involved in some other areas of ministry. Maybe you need to talk with me or go have that lunch or coffee with someone. But you've got to get to where you're not holding back anymore. So that's my invitation today. Is to, is to decide. If you haven't accepted Christ, let's do it. But if you're holding back, no more. Won't you come as we stand and sing?